Welcome to today's lesson where we're going to look at chapters 36 to 40 of The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. It's Mrs Bart here today and I'm looking forward to exploring how the theme of sex and sexuality is developed in this part of the novel. You will need the usual equipment for this lesson and I will give you some time to organise yourself and press the pause button if you haven't got it. Let me just take you through the learning objectives for today. The first is to explore Atwood's authorial methods in presenting themes of sex and sexuality. That's an AO2 focus. There's also an AO3 focus today, which is to consider the feminist and historical context of gender, sex and sexuality. Go ahead and press the pause button if you need to get yourself organised and play when you're ready to move on. And here's a reminder that um, we'd like you to turn off the notifications on your smartphone so that you can focus on the learning today. Today's Do Now is going to be introduced. Um, the learning question is how is the theme of sex and sexuality developed and that's for our entire lesson but let me just talk you through the do now so the chapters that we're focusing on today are to be found in section 12 of the novel which is entitled Jezebel's so I just wanted to pass on to you that the name Jezebel comes from a source um, as many things are in the handmaid's tale the name is taken from um, a book of the old testament in the bibles the book of one kings the wife of ahab is called jezebel that's her name but it's been used to describe um, a woman who is shameless immoral controlling and reckless often a woman who puts too much makeup on her face and, and that stems from the source of the Bible and its kind of stereotype in society and a literary archetype as well. Your do now has several parts to it. The first is to be found in the purple box. I'd like you to think back and see if you can recall the knowledge that was passed on to you earlier on in the unit of work about 1984 in America. Why did Atwood use religion in this way, thinking about the historical context of the US elections of 1984 um, in her Eustopia. There's other questions to consider in the box on the right hand side. In what ways is Offred a Jezebel? And I'd like you to use your knowledge of the whole text to respond to that. I'd like you to try to recall what other biblical story lies at the heart of Gilead for question two. And then for question three, what feminine stereotypes are reinforced by these stories? Think about your cement lessons for this. And how do these help to oppress women in Gilead? It's a substantial do now, so you're going to need to take your time with it once you press pause. But I'm also throwing out a challenge for us to discuss later. What do you make of the apostrophe in Jezebel's? So go ahead and press the pause button. Take your time with this do now and play when you're ready for my take on the do now. <coughs> We're going to be discussing the do now in one of our class discussions, but hopefully you've come to the idea that Atwood is making some suggestions about patriarchal societies here, that they often tend to divide women into two types, stereotypes if you like, the virgin and the whore. In Gilead, all of the women are supposed to fit into this category of the virginal. You've got the sexless wives, daughters, even the aunts that train the handmaids, the Marthas who are virtually invisible, and the holy handmaids who have got the consecrated task of reproduction. All of these Female characters have sexual lives that are tightly restricted. It's not until we get to this section of the novel and these chapters that we're going to look at today where we are introduced to the idea, the other female type, the whores. And these are the prostitutes at Jezebel's. 
we have noted before that Marthas often look down on handmaids as if they are whores as well. So there are two perspectives on handmaids within the novel. But we haven't come across the classic literary archetype of the whore until we get to these chapters that deal with Jezebels. Jezebel, if you remember from the previous slide, um, and for whom the men's club is named, is this evil Old Testament queen who is a manipulative character. She's very guilty of all sorts of sexual depravities. And it's from this source that the literary archetype that sort of symbolises this prototypical femme fatale, vicious woman in the Judeo-Christian imagination comes out in literature. For the men of Gilead, these typical patriarchal characters, there is no middle ground for women. There is no grey area. Women are either virgins or whores. So it's interesting that Offred, the handmaid, who is typically supposed to be virginal in the society of Gilead, is brought to Jezebel, to, to, to the club, Jezebel's. Let's move on to think about um, something that the commander says when he's having a conversation with Offred at Jezebel's. It's nature's plan, he says. There's some tasks that I'd like you to do. Let me introduce them. First of all, I'd like you to explain in your own words the view of the role of women and sexual morality according to the values of Gilead. You may use evidence from other parts of the text if you wish to do that. Then I would like you to think about this question. What can we infer about this standpoint from the commander's words? He says, nature demands variety for men. In this, he refers to modern sociobiology, which is interesting because for the most part, Gilead has rejected modern science. And then the third thing I'd like you to think about, how is Atwood presenting the age-old patriarchal double standard here? This again will take you some time, so press pause and take your time to think through and respond to these questions as fully as possible. Press play when you're ready to hear some new knowledge from me. Okay, so hopefully you've had some time to grapple with these tasks, these questions. Of course, the Club Jezebel has been presented to us by Atwood to expose the hypocrisy of these very powerful men, the ruling elite of this Gileadean society, the commanders who preach about sexual morality, but now we find out spend their evenings with prostitutes. Officially, of course, Gilead draws its ideology from the Old Testament, although we know it, it twists the Old Testament to, sort, to suit its own ideas, and it completely rejects modern science. So it's interesting, isn't it, that the commander to justify the existence of Jezebels employs the rhetoric of late 20th century evolutionary psychologists to lecture off Red on how men need multiple sexual partners because, quote from the commander, nature demands variety, it's part of the procreational strategy. Here we see that the commanders are very much picking and choosing from earlier traditions as they please. The Old Testament is their main source and very useful um, for them to subjugate women. But even though on the whole they reject modern science, they, it's not beyond them to use modern sociobiology to provide justification for their own low sexual immoral standards and their own womanising. This is, of course, 
the age-old patriarchal double standard that most patriarchal societies operate on. I'm now going to pass on some embedded non-fiction, some knowledge, actually about a context that you might think isn't really relevant to the study of The Handmaid's Tale. It's about American history and we know the novel is set in what was America. Um, but this is some black history about the period of slavery which might come in useful for our next analysis. The Underground Railroad, in which a very famous figure, if you look at the picture, is a woman called Harriet Tubman, operated during the time of slavery in American history, the antebellum era, as um, we've called it when we've studied streetcar. So the Underground Railroad was a network of people, African-American as well as white, offering shelter and aid to escaped slaves from the South. It developed as a convergence of several different clandestine efforts. The exact date of its existence aren't known, but we know it operated from the late 18th century to the Civil War, at which point its efforts continued to undermine the Confederacy in a, a less secretive fashion. The Quakers, a religious group that appear in The Handmaid's Tale, interestingly, are considered the first organised group to actively help escaped slaves. George Washington complained in 1786 that Quakers had attempted to liberate one of his slaves. <coughs> People known as conductors guided the fugitive slaves. Hiding places included private homes, churches and schoolhouses. These were called stations, safe houses and depots. The people operating them were actually called station masters. There were many well-used routes stretching west through Ohio to Indiana and Iowa. Others headed north through Pennsylvania and into New England or through Detroit on their way to Canada. If you're interested in reading more about it, there's a wealth of non-fiction resources that I can point you to, but there's also a really lovely fictional novel called The Underground Ra Railroad by Colson White. How does this apply to The Handmaid's Tale? I've entitled this slide Down with the Feminists, and there's some tasks I'd like you to do. On page 264. Offred comments on Moira's narrative right at the end. When Moira tells us her story of what happened to her after she escaped from the Red Centre, Offred says this about it. I'd like her, meaning Moira, to end with something daring and spectacular, some outrage, something that would befit her. How does that suggest something different than if Atwood wrote this? I've changed the quote slightly. What if Offred said this? I'd like her to end with something daring and spectacular, some outrage, something that would suit her. So we're really talking about the differences and connotations between the original word befit and a more ordinary word like suit. What might this word befit tell us about Offred's perception of Moira and her spirit? What do you make of references to do with Moira's sexuality and how she's permitted to express it in Jezebel's? The next thing I'd like you to do is think about the feminism of the 1980s as we've learned, the feminism of the 1980s was turbulent. We were moving away from second wave feminism to a different kind of feminism. What is Atwood referencing here in this dystopia from your knowledge of this context? What has Gilead done to or for feminism in your opinion? 
And the last question I'd like you to tackle is, how does Atwood use the historical background of the Underground Railroad to suggest ideas about oppression with this underground female road that's in The Handmaid's Tale. And to answer that, I'd like you all to begin in a particular way. I'd like you to use this sentence data. Although the Underground Railroad is a historical phenomenon, and then continue from there. Again, this is a substantial set of tasks. So once you press pause, take your time, and um, when you're ready to hear more from me, press play. But don't do that until you've completed these tasks. So hopefully you've had some time to think. It's interesting, isn't it, that during her encounter with Moira, Offred learns that the spirit of her mother and of Moira, who are both figures of, of transgression and strong resistance. They are broken women now. At the Red Centre, Moira was an icon whose actions suggested that fighting Gilead was possible. Offred's mother, a lifelong feminist and political activist, embodied everything that Gilead condemns. Although Offred once took for granted the freedoms of her mother's generation and what her, her mother's generation fought for. Now she's trapped in Gilead. And she realises that her mother was like Moira, um, an embodiment of resistance to the regime. But at Jezebel's, we have a very different Moira. A Moira who is resigned to her fate. She seems, even though she's escaped the fate of the handmaid, she's listless and trapped in Jezebel's. Instead of embodying defiance, she now seems to embody Gilead's ability to crush even the strongest of spirits. You know, when Offred learns that her mother went to the colonies, she must know deep down that her mother will not have any strength left for resistance, even if she is still alive. There is one flash of hope, though, that lights up Moira's narrative, and this is this description of the underground female road, this underground network working to smuggle women out of Gilead into Canada. This name, of course, references the Underground Railroad um, that existed in history, which, as you've just learnt, transported escaped slaves from safe house to safe house in the antebellum days before the Civil War in the United States. So the fact that such a network exists in Gilead gives us a sense that even if someone like Moira has, herself has given up hope, the struggle against Gilead presses on. Let's look at the final idea, which is about how sex is explored in these chapters. This, of course, is a theme that is being developed and has been introduced in previous chapters. First of all, what I'd like you to do. First, I'd like you to select evidence worthy of analysis to support the exploration of Offred's two sexual encounters in these chapters. One with the commander, and then shortly after that, with Nick. Once you've selected that evidence, I'd like you to explain how Atwood is using juxtaposition of these two encounters to develop ideas about sex in the novel. And then I'd like you to evaluate and make a judgment about how successful this method of juxtaposition might be in the light of patriarchal stereotypes of women and particularly the literary archetypes 
that we've looked at together in previous lessons. Again, plenty to do here. So press pause while you grapple with these three tasks and press play once you've spent some time on these and you're ready to hear from me. <coughs> so, Atwood uses juxtaposition of Offred's sexual encounters with the commander and with Nick to highlight the difference between forced sex and sex by choice. While the commander has sex with her, Offred cannot muster any pas passion. We know what her experience is like during the ritualised sex and this kind of more illicit encounter with the commander um, still doesn't allow her to muster any passion. In fact, her passivity disappoints the commander who, while in previous chapters, seems to dismiss this idea of romance and passion, seems to want it now in the context and the setting of Jezebel's. Um, and it is interesting, again, his hypocrisy in saying that, you know, Gilead has provided a better route for women, taking the uncertainty of romance and passion away from them, amputating the feelings, as Offred suggests. Um, and despite his critique of romance and passion, he seems to want it. Um, and despite his praise for arranged marriages, somehow he seems to still think there's a place for it. Either way, Offred can't engage in the sexual encounter in the way that the commander is expecting her to. It is possibly suggested by Atwood in her novel that Af Offred can't give the commander the passion because she's still sleeping with him against her will. And of course, romance is about the soul's liberty to exercise its free will, to choose who to fall in love with. It's interesting both times that the commander hasn't really seen the point of love. Because Gilead outlaws the freedom essential to passion, the commander cannot call it into being to suit his whims. And Atwood is, by this juxtaposition, showing that. Now, Offred and Nick's coupling is different, isn't it? Even though Serena is engineering it, it's much more voluntary on the part of Offred. Serena has no power to make Offred have sex with Nick. And so there's more of a spark here and a sense of desire. Isn't it interesting that Offred narrates the scene in two different ways, in a sort of elegaic tone, almost mourning something that she has lost from her past. And she is de depicting the act of sex with Nick as something from this world that's now vanished from her, this world of romance and courtship and love, something that the commander tries to, to do in chapter 36, where he's kind of trying to court her and present the trip to Jezebel's as an act of courtship when he says he's going to take her out. But of course, it doesn't seem that way to Offred. It's ironic, isn't it, that one of the things that Nick says to Offred, almost as a request, no romance. And this reminds them both of what they cannot have. And yet, it's this encounter with Nick where Offred is able to feel something.
It's time for the plenary now. We're looking at chapters 36 to 40 as a whole. And time to give you an opportunity to crystallise your ideas on this learning question. How is the theme of sex and sexuality developed in these chapters? As you can see from this, I would like you to do a main body paragraph that has the usual components A01 and A02 but then is developed into an AO3 contextual analysis. So I'd like you to bring in some of the old knowledge that you've got on um, the political climate of the US elections in America of 1984, of feminism in those times, maybe also the new historical context knowledge of the Underground Railroad and... Um, how that might um, impact the way that Atwood is presenting um, feminism and, and how she uses that to develop the theme of sex and sexuality. So you're going to begin with a beautiful claim. You're going to be using substantial textual evidence to support that directly afterwards, but also throughout your answer, using a wide range of textual references. Um, you'll need to analyse the methods that Atwood uses. Um, I think you should be looking at juxtaposition, among other methods, and um, then to develop into your contextual analysis. This will, of course, take you some time, so you're going to need to um, submit this according to the dates and instructions on Show My Homework. We're also going to be having um, a teens lesson on this to further our discussions and to develop our thinking on it before the deadline. So make sure you tune into that lesson. Thank you for your focus today, Year 12. I hope you enjoy reflecting on how themes of sex, sexuality, possibly gender as well, have been developed in these chapters. And I'll be looking forward to reading your commentaries.